Uh, professor Yavuz uh, is a professor of political science at the University of Utah. Um, he studies and, and researches uh, topics such as secularism, ethnic conflict, uh, transnational Islamic networks, civil society, and uh, the politics of the public sphere. Uh, Professor Yavu's publications include Turkey's July 15th coup, What Happened and Why, um, War and Collapse, World War I, and The Ottoman State uh, with Feroz Ahmed in 2015, uh, War and Diplomacy, the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-1878, and the Treaty of Berlin uh, from tw 2013. Uh, he is a prominent columnist uh, in the weekly uh, Turkish Action and an editorial member of Critique, Silk Road, Journal of Muslim Minority Affairs, and uh, many other um, venues. Uh, I first encountered uh, Professor Yavuz uh, when I was in graduate school. Um, one of the things that I worked on in graduate school was uh, Turkish politics, and uh, he's been a very prominent voice in helping those of us um, who are new initiates to the complex world of, of Turkish politics to get well grounded. And uh, he has been here at BYU, but it's been about a decade, I think, and uh, we're, we're really delighted to have you here. Uh, Professor Yavuz was just telling me this morning that uh, he was one of just, just a few uh, Turkish scholars who were invited uh, to the UN General Assembly uh, to meet with uh, Turkish President Erdogan when he was in the United States uh, in the fall. Um, and uh, for those of you that have been following Turkish affairs, you will recognize that uh, it's been a very turbulent time uh, in Turkey. There's been uh, a re redefinition to some degree of the way that uh, Turkish government sees its role, um, the way that they have changed uh, narratives uh, about uh, how Turkey has a place in the world. Um, and part of that has to do with a longing and nostalgia for the Ottoman Empire, which we're going to hear about today. So well, we were, we're going to proceed for about 30, 40 minutes uh, listening to Professor Yavuz. We will have some time at the end for questions. Uh, please think of your questions as we go along, and we have a microphone on this side. If you could come up and state your name, what you're studying, uh, and your question, uh, we will go until shortly before noon. Thank you, Professor Yavuz. Well, thank you very much, Queen. Thanks for this kind invitation. Um, this is a new project, um, a new project. Um, uh, it is going on for a long time, actually. Um, again, I'm a trained political scientist, but um, I felt somewhat uncomfortable in political science, and I am more comfortable going back and forth history and political science. I think history becomes much more important. So this politics of nostalgia, this is not a, uh, what is going on in Turkey is not unique to Turkey. I think this politics of nostalgia, in a way, there is a global wave of uh, new imagined, new type of politics based on uh, constructed past such as in the case of the United States, we had the president, he wants to make America great again. Making America great again, but he doesn't tell us which period he wants to take as a model. In Russia, you have the similar problem. In China, there is this nostalgia. Uh, there is, maybe this had to do with our faith, we lost the faith in utopia or in future. And there is, the, with the wave of nationalism and religious movements as well, especially ISIS, nostalgia becomes something very important, restoring the past to the present and future. The nostalgia is based on the issue of memory more than history. So what we are going to talk today is not necessarily history of Turkey, but how the history of Turkey constructed, recreated to cope with contemporary problems. In other words, what we are seeing with neo-Ottomanism, an attempt to address three fundamental problems 
we face today in Turkey, the problem of legitimacy, the legitimacy of the state, legitimacy of the society, because of the republic, the way in which it was constructed by Mustafa Kemal, some way that secular nation state based legitimacy became much weaker or that legitimacy of uh, Mustafa Kemal, by Mustafa Kemal is the founder of the Republic of Turkey and uh, his ideology or the founding philosophy of the Turkish Republic was Kemalism and the Kemalism very much uh, uh, based on nationalism and secularism. The second problem we have in Turkey in addition to the issue of legitimacy, the question of normativity. It is linked to the issue of legitimacy, but it is also separate in terms of the what should be the glue of Turkish society, what should be the cement of Turkish society, because the cement or the glue the founding father, the Mustafa Kemal, imagined was a secular nation state. That cement doesn't work anymore because that cement under the internal and external pressure became much weaker. So this issue of normativity, norms, principles of the society, what is right and what is wrong, Kemalism somewhat with the secular language failed to provide a, prover, a, a proper answer. The third issue, the crisis of Turkey, I, I call it a crisis of identity. Again, it is linked to crisis of legitimacy, crisis of normativity. Now the crisis of identity because some way there is a disagreement over the Turkish identity or why, who is a Turk. This question is now raised in the country. The second, there is a Turkishness became a contested zone, whether the, the Turks from the Balkans or the Turks from the Caucasus or the Turks of the Anatolia, who should define the proper Turkishness. And then you also, this crisis of identity became more intense because of the challenge of the Kurdish issue, that the 15 to 20 percent of Turkey consists of Kurds. Uh, also, you have the issue, the politics of identity also brought the demand of uh, a set of religious communities, such as the Alevis or some other Sufi groups, uh, the, such as Nakshibandia as well. So what we have as a total problem is the crisis of the founding philosophy of the republic. This crisis again very much revealed or became a, a reality, the crisis itself, as a result of both domestic and international changes and transformation in and around Turkey. In terms of the domestic uh, factors which undermine the found in philosophy of the republic, also provided a ground or a site for reimagination of Turkish identity, normativity, and legitimacy. Um, there are th three factors. One a factor is the democratization of country after 1950s. Second, um, the economic development, especially neoliberal economic policies of Turgut Özal, played an important role in terms of allowing different identities to challenge the hegemony of the Kemalism. The third, I would say, the public sphere. Uh, the public sphere, the media, the TV, the privatization of the TV channels also became provided a site to challenge the founding philosophy and recreate or reimagine a new identity. So uh, there are two competing and conflicting uh, what was offered as a solution or a constructed solution, people try to draw the lessons and possible solutions from the past, the Ottoman past. In Turkey, not Islamism, but the Ottomanism and Islamism. Ottomanism becomes a surrogate identity for Islamism. And um, 
So does Ottoman debate, neo-Ottomanism, link to also this discussion of Islamism in Turkey as well? Because Turkish Islam is somewhat different. We will come to that. In, in regard to neo-Ottomanism, there are two competing and conflicting neo-Ottomanism. One is Turgut Özal's neo-Ottomanism. Uh, let me go all the way to the last uh, just uh, in terms of Özal's neo-Ottomanism, he was a Nakshibandi Sufi himself, very much believed in neoliberal economic policies of Turgut Özal. He was somewhat along the same political philosophy of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, that the market is good, society should be strengthened against the state. So his Ottomanism was a civic pro-European, Özal was the one, even though he came from a Muslim background, he applied for the EU membership. It was under the Özal, Turkey made the application to join the European Union. Özal was more cosmopolitan. He was, uh, he, he was challenged during his prime minister by the Kurdish issue, and he tried to, in a way, contain or silenced the Kurdish nationalist demand through Ottomanism, that the Turkishness is not a solution. We are all the children of the Ottoman Empire, and then we are all Muslim. This Islamness and Ottomanism in the now Ottomanist discourse goes interchangeably. Some way there is a close connection. And Özal was also neoliberal. His imagined Ottoman was neoliberal, whereas the Erdogan's Ottomanism, he also considers and tries to present himself as neo-Ottoman in terms of, as a way of addressing those three crises of legitimacy, identity, and normativity. And the solution, uh, both Özal and uh, center-right pro-Islamic parties, they try to provide a solution to contemporary problems from the past, that, uh, but this past is again deconstructed past. Erdogan's neo-Ottomanism is a religious, it is not civic. For him, the ummah, the Muslim identity, is something very important. Second, he's very anti-European and pan-Islamic. He is more active of the human rights issue of the Palestinians or the Muslims in Myanmar, but he doesn't involve human rights violation of other minorities, including in Turkey, we have a major human rights uh, violation in regard to Kurds and other groups. But he's, this pan-Islamic mode is dominant. He is not cosmopolitan, very much the ummah-based exclusivist. And he's not liberal, but authoritarian. So, and for Özal, the, his model of the Ottoman Sultan was Fatih Sultan Mehmet, who conquered Istanbul, he recognized, the, he, he created the millet system. In a way, he, create, he turned Ottoman Empire into a religious confederation by recognizing, even though it was hierarchical system, the religious communities were not equal, but he recognized and tolerated the Orthodox Church, Armenian Church, and the Jewish community as a separate autonomous communities. So um, for Özal, Fatih Sultan Mehmet was a model. For Erdogan, his favorite sultan, Abdulhamid II. He even, uh, the government funds movies about his life. There is an ongoing series on Turkish uh, public TV about Abdulhamid. Uh, so he very much models himself Abdul Hamid II, he was a very authoritarian, pan-Islamist sultan. Now let me go all the way back. Again, I just wanted to, uh, since uh, saying something about the Ottoman uh, Empire, and um, what we have, uh, the Ottoman Empire, it, the date is wrong, it should be 1980. So I put 2018. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, but, <laughs> so uh, Ottoman Empire was a cosmopolitan 
Muslim empire, but it was not an Islamic empire. Uh, what um, the Ottoman Empire had several characteristics, just to summarize. One is it was Central Asian uh, Turkic groups were the founders of this empire, but they were, uh, they were not fully Arabized. Some way they kept their Islam filtered through their Central Asian tradition. That brings us the issue of Yasa and Kanuni. In the Ottoman Empire, um, the legal pluralism was dominant. But for public affairs, public issues were not run according to Sharia, but according to Yasa and Kanun. Uh, the Kanun means the, the declaration of sovereign. This tradition comes from the Central Asia, the Cengizi in Yasa, there is a, a very good book on this by Halil Inalcik, the, the most prominent Ottoman historian. Um, so this, the Turkish or the Ottoman Islam, the Kanun is a one step ahead of Sharia. This is very important, that the Sharia is sometimes evaluated, examined within this Kanun. Second, the empire uh, was cosmopolitan. The third, it was a Sunni, Hanafi, Sufi, dominant identity, both of the Muslim, among the Muslims and the ruling elite of the empire. A majority of empire until 1877-78 remained Christian, Orthodox Christian. Empire only became majority Muslim when they lost the Balkans, all that area, uh, because uh, again, the Russian, uh, Russia involved in a number of wars, and the, uh, m most of the Muslims were forced out from the Balkans, and then the Muslims forced out from the Caucasus, including from, from the Crimea. In other words, after 19th century, Anatolia became the refuge for Muslim minorities. The Republic of Turkey or is a nation of refugees. Our founding father, Mustafa Kemal, he was born in Salonika, today is Greece. He was raised in Skopje, today is Macedonia. His most of the education took place in Albania. To the, it was part of the empire. And not an ethnic Turk, but a Slav, Slavic Muslim. Until 1960s, according to Eric Zurcher, a prominent uh, late Ottoman period historian, he argues that until 1960s, most of the president, prime ministers, and the cabinet, most of them were born in the lost territories of the Ottoman Empire, in the Balkans, especially in Macedonia. And uh, Kenan Evren, before Turgut Özal, he was Albanian. Süleyman Demirel, he became president after Özal, he's Bosnian. And uh, Erdogan himself, the current president or authoritarian ruler of Turkey, Georgian, he's a Georgian Muslim. So Turkey is a nation of refugees. This refugee aspect is very important because the melting pot, in a way, Anatolia, the mechanism which brought these people together is Islam. So the Islam in Turkey is not only a religion, it is also glue and cement brought these people together. And the Mustafa Kemal and founding fathers, they tried to replace this glue, take it away, and make it a secular nationalist glue, and it did not work. I would say. It, it didn't fail totally, but I, I think what it evolved, it went to a major transformation today. So uh, this Turkish, there is something called Turkish Islam, different than Arab, Persian, Malay Islam. From my perspective, there are seven different competing and conflicting Islams, and Turkish Islam has its own characteristics in terms of Sufism. It's a state-centric Islam. Turkey never was colonized. That also 
made Turks to imagine Islam and being European as Özal did in a more comfortably than I would say those colonized Muslim countries in the Arab world or Indonesia or some other places. But that's a different issue, the Turkish Islam. Now, uh, the Ottoman Empire collapsed as a result of nationalist movement, as a result of um, uh, the industrialization and the penetration of the colonialism. And uh, World War I destroyed three empires, including the Ottoman Empire. And these children of the Rumeli, they are ethnically not Turk, but Muslims, they led the war of independence during the World War I. And in a way, they created the, the carved land of what is called today Turkey. And they, coming from the East Europe, and their own thinking, the model was different. So what they did, they created a Republic of Turkey, and this identity became secular. In Turkey, secularism is not a separation of religion and politics. In Turkey, secularism is an identity. A group of people, I would say a large sector of the population, they say, we are like. Like means um, secular, laicite from the French. Um, and the secularism in Turkey also is not separation of religion and politics. It is also a project of becoming European. And it is an ideology of the state to criminalize the opposition as well. So secularism in the context of Turkey has a multiple roles, strategies, and functions. It is not only separation of state and uh, religion, because Turkish secularism, the religion, is very much controlled by the state, similar to Orthodox churches in the Balkans. That the Islam today, most of the mosques in Turkey are owned by state. Those are state buildings. And the imam or the preachers of these mosques are paid by um, Turkish state as well. So um, yet to be a Turk in the Turkish identity, also to, uh, even though the Republic tried to get rid of Islam, and they changed the alphabet, they got rid of all Islamic practices and institutions to create a, a Turk. In other words, let me summarize, Mustafa Kemal, and those refugee children coming from Rumelia, Rumelia means the Balkans, coming from the Balkans, they wanted to create an identity in the future. Whereas Anatolian conservative masses and some notables, they wanted to discover, rediscover identity in the past that the founding fathers were future-looking or future-oriented. They thought that the identity could be constructed. It would be possible for Turkey to be a European secular nation state. But the Anatolian conservative masses and nobility, they said that is not a possibility. This is going to disarm us from our normativity, our legitimacy, including our language. And they insisted on reconstructing or rediscovering Turkishness in the past. I think this is another tension what is going on in the country. Um, now, uh, the, this whole debate in Turkey is over constructing a new identity on the basis of new memory. Again, the memory and history are not the same. History is much more objective study, even though objective uh, is um, another issue, but it is more scholarly way of study in the past. What is the memory? Is what you bring to the present, or constructing past, or relocating past into the present, within in terms of the needs and the challenges of the present situation. In Turkey, again, uh, this crisis of those three crises uh, are, um, became more dominant 
I would say, after 1980s. But the Ottomanism, this memory construction, um, the Kemalism very much identified the Ottoman Empire as the other, Islam as the source of backwardness, Islam as a negative force. This was the Kemalist uh, image or understanding of Islam. So in a way, because of this Kemalist attempt to otherize Islam, Islam in Turkey after 1950 with the democrat democratization or multi-party system, Islam became an oppositional identity, not only a religion, but an oppositional identity and oppositional language. And the Islam is because legally it was impossible to establish an Islamic party, or legally it was not uh, a crime to make any argument on the basis of Islam, most of the conservatives or Islamically oriented groups, they try to develop their argument within Ottomanism or Ottoman past, Ottoman history. In a way, the Ottoman identity, Ottomanism became a surrogate identity for uh, Anatolian masses or the counter elite in the case of Anatolia. Um, now, this Ottomanism and no Ottomanism, these are not the same. Uh, the Ottomanism uh, very much, uh, again, Ottomanism itself emerged in response to a crisis of nationalism, especially the independence of Greece and ongoing rebellions in Serbia. Ottoman Empire tried to create a civic uh, identity or a uh, trans-ethnic or religious identity, uh, creating a new glue, new civic nation formation. This was what Ottomanism tried to do in 1839. The Ottoman Empire issued the, with the Tanzimat reforms, uh, modernization reform, became a way of trying to uh, overcome religious and ethnic tension in society and creating supra-ethnic uh, and religious identity. Uh, and also the equality and the rule of law was part of the Tanzimat project as well. Um, whereas neo-Ottomanism, it if you stretch it, what you find, it is an anti-Republican, anti-Kemalist intellectual discourse, ideas. And because of the oppressive state pressure and criminalization of the Islamic language or Islamic discourse, so this Ottoman memory, Ottomanism, reconstructed and reimagined uh, not necessarily in the universities, because universities were in the hand of the republic to create its own ideology, in, indoctrinate the student, but the music, literature, poetry, art became the new sites of containing, reimagining, reconstructing Ottoman past. Uh, outside the control of the state, especially the literature uh, by Yahya Kemal, Ahmet Hamdi Tampanar, a number of the Turkish literature became the main site of reimagining or recreating a new gloom. There is one thing, the Turkish Islamist intellectual, when you look at them, in 1980s and 1990s, compare with the Arab, especially Egyptian Islamic intellectuals, most of the Turkish Islamic intellectuals, they were uh, either poet, writer, whereas in the case of Egypt, more engineers, doctors. So in Turkey, this Islamic movement or Islamic debate, it uh, discussed more or less within the humanities, especially the Sufism, the Sufi sites of the Tekke. Tekke means the Sufi lodge. Uh, and then this Sufi literature 
became an alternative site outside the control of the state to construct a counter memory against the republic. So um, this, my work now, uh, I'm trying to examine the Turkish literature to see how these ideas developed, symbols, idea, ideas developed in literature, how those ideas turn into a policy. The Ottomanism, neo-Ottomanism, uh, very much the set of ideas and symbols turned into a policy first by Özal because of the genocide in Bosnia-Herzegovina was going on. Second, the Karabakh issue was going on between Armenia and Azerbaijan and Turkey got involved. Third, it was the end of the Cold War. Fourth, the most important factor of Özal to give up Turkishness and to uh, turn the set of ideas into a policy was the Kurdish challenge and Kurdish issue that the, with the Ottomanism, he tried to create a space or transcend ethnic Turkish and ethnic Kurdish nationalism. And uh, I would say uh, today, um, I want to end uh, since I think I am, um, um, today, under the leadership of Recep Tayyip Erdogan, the foreign policy, very much uh, they turned neo-Ottomanism into an instrument, or in the foreign policy as a type of ideology, to um, bring Islam back. The Turkish Islam is always free of Sharia, the Sharia debate. Again, it, this had to do with both the Sufism and the Ottoman legacy of the Kanun. So to bring Islam back, and for Turkish Islamists, the model golden age of Islam for Arabs, usually the period of Prophet Muhammad from 610 to 664, even though Prophet passed away in 632, six, six, uh, four, the period of the four caliphate also considered the Salafi, considered the period of a golden age. For Turkish Muslims, golden age remains the Ottoman Empire. Therefore, uh, Ottomanism, bringing Ottoman back also means you bring Islam back as well. But the question is what type of Islam? The Islam of Turgut Özal or Islam of Erdogan? Because Islam, uh, there are, even within Turkish Islam, you have different imagined, different types of Islam that the Islam itself became contested zone. In other words, to conclude, uh, we go back to the beginning. Turkey confronts three crises of legitimacy, identity, and normativity. And the solution became Ottomanism, but the content of that Ottomanism, very much Islam. But what we see today, that there is no agreement on Islam because you don't have cardinal, you don't have infallible religious leader, you don't have a religious shura, you don't have a Khamenei, Khamenei, the spiritual leader of uh, Iran. So you lack religious authority. Therefore, the solution what they try to bring created more debate, tension, and conflict because which Islam, who is Islam. I think this is the debate what is going on in Turkey. Thank you very much again. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I, I, I should have limited myself with 30 minutes, but. Uh,
Jared Russell. I'm an international relations major and a Middle Eastern studies minor. And I actually have two questions, if I could ask two questions. The first one is, what is your explanation? Because you've kind of, from how I've understood, you've kind of talked about Turkey in a general sense. I, maybe you're just talking about the, reg, the re, Erdogan's regime. But with the most recent referendum, where people voted yes or no for the reorganization of the Constitution and the presidential powers and whatnot, it was a pretty 50-50 split. So it seems like half the population kind of sides with Ozal's neo-Ottomanism and half the population sides with Erdogan's neo-Ottomanism. So what is your explanation for that? And does, does the entirety of Turkey want this neo-Ottomanism or not? And my second question is, in your uh, academic opinion, do you think that Erdogan's end goal with his version of neo-Ottomanism is to reinstate the caliphate that was abolished when Mustafa Kemal Ataturk uh, abolished it? Those are my two questions. Thank you. Well, the referendum um, was uh, Turkey had a coup. We are still debating what to the who led the coup. But Erdogan benefited a great deal from this coup attempt. And he declared a state of emergency. And Turkey today is under, in a way, some kind of martial law. And under that legal situation, Erdogan uh, decided to change from a parliamentary system to presidential system. And Turkey remained a parliamentary system since the republic. But even the Ottoman, the parliament, the Ottoman parliament was also tried to construct or um, the, the parliamentarism has been somewhat the tradition. But uh, the Erdogan wanted to uh, turned us into a presidential system. But it is a type of presidential system that there is no model out there. It is a supreme a la Turca presidential system. What that means, he just jailed two uh, members of the Constitutional Court because they were critical of him. He put all those judges who opened investigation about his corruption case. Uh, they are all in jail now, <laughs> including, unfortunately, policemen. They are all in jail as well. So you have a one-man authoritarian system. And the country, I would say, the elections were tempered, and he, they intervened in the election, according to a uh, European um, uh, Council, a uh, number of independent monitoring groups. They said elections were neither fair or free, the referendum. So uh, it, he won 51%, but I think there was a lots of intervention. And um, what he wants to do, uh, Erdogan, um, his role model is Putin, and uh, he uh, he, he turned Islam into an instrument. Uh, uh, Turkish public today, the way in which he used the Islam, the, uh, especially young people now, stay away or turn against Islam. What you have, Islamless Islam. In other words, Islam free of its ethical and moral core. Unfortunately, this is where we are. It became a political instrument in the hand of Erdogan to criminalize opposition, the way in which the Kemalists use secularism to criminalize their own opposition, unfortunately. This is what is going on. Um, he wants to be, a, yes, a Sunni, not a sultan, because sultan is not enough for him. He wants to be the khalif, yes. But it is impossible because most of the Arabs, the Muslim Brotherhood would accept him. And Muslim Brotherhood, most of them are now, as you know, forced out of the region. Some of them are either in Qatar, but mostly they are in Istanbul. So the Istanbul became the main center of Muslim Brotherhood leadership or the politicians, they ran away 
from Egypt, Tunisia, or other Arab countries. But I think uh, the caliphate is somewhat impossible. But from my own perspective, I do believe there is a crisis of authority in Islam. That crisis of authority of in, in Islam could only be solved by creating, restoring caliphate. I think it is very essential to do this. And uh, it could be the center of the caliphate, could be Kuala Lumpur, or it could be Istanbul, or it could be Sarajevo, as some elected uh, a council and the leader. I really think that um, from my own uh, thinking, uh, this institution building would help a great deal to overcome this crisis of authority in Islam. Because you have Abdullah al naim on one hand, a professor at Emory University. He thinks that the secularism is necessary for Islam. Islam cannot survive without secularism. This is one perspective versus the ISIS or the al-Nusra. So whoever wakes up in the morning issues a fatwa, it creates a major chaos. I think you need uh, some kind of institution, but Erdogan is not. He's the most corrupt leader. I, 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 there are, uh, you know, uh, uh, for instance, a mufti, the former mufti of Sarajevo, the Bosnia-Herzegovina, Mustafa Saric, he could be a perfect caliph. There are a number of uh, Nur Khalis Majid, he died, Indonesian Muslim scholar, a very moral man. He could be a perfect person. There are people out there, but Erdogan would be the last person. <laughs> Actually, I probably don't even need the mic. I've got a loud voice. So I'm Rob Swanson. I'm a history major. Um, so one of the questions that I have is, uh, does this, uh, does the neo-Ottoman, Ottoman, uh, Ottomanism, does that influence the current Turkish politics with the Syrian Kurds? And what the the invasion of Syria by Turkish forces? Um, does Ottomanism very much emerged um, and turn into a policy? as a solution to Kurdish nationalist demand. So the Kurds were first, uh, were a little surprised that what is going on. Uh, but eventually the Kurdish intellectuals realized that this is another Turkish game to suppress their demand and contain their right to self-determination. So, uh, this is the view of the secular Kurdish intellectuals. But the religious Kurds, I would say majority of the Kurds are more religious than Turks. The Islamic movement in Turkey also, both the Nakshibendiya and the Nur movement, are very much dominated by Kurdish ulama in, from Southeast Anatolia. So the Kurdish population somewhat more conservative Yet, the people who are more active out there are the secular Alevi Kurds. The Kurds in Turkey, you have Alevis and you have Sunnis. 30% of Turkey is Alevi, 70% Sunni. And in Turkey, uh, the Alevis, uh, majority of the Alevis are Turks, 30% of Alevis are Kurds. Alevi Kurd and Alevi Turk do marry. Alevi Kurd and Sunni Kurd do not marry. Still, religious identity more dominant in Turkey, more than ethnicity. So, the Ottomanism has some buyers in, among the Kurds. Uh, so, it did help a great deal to soften and cope with the demands of the Kurds. But today, we reach to the point that the Kurdish nationalism is full-fledged. It is very uh, secular-oriented. And uh, most of the Kurds, they vote for Kurdish ethnic party, HDP. 
their former leader is in jail because he said some negative things about Erdogan. So this is how he deals with the opposition. Many Kurdish members of the parliament are in jail. So the Kurds supported Erdogan in 2002 election until 2013. But now the Kurds are, I think his policies uh, moved Kurds away. And Erdogan became more insecure. And to overcome this insecurity, he allied himself with the Nationalist Party. So he very much uh, became a nationalist. The way in which the Milosevic became nationalist, he moved from communism to nationalism in 1990s. Erdogan has also made a major shift from Islamism uh, to nationalism, but his nationalism is also very much mixed with the Islamism as well. But as far as when it comes to the Kurds, he is nationalist. When it comes to the Palestinian issue, he is Islamist. So it depends on the issue, but uh, he wasn't very nationalist oriented, but now he is because of the Kurdish territorial, uh, some of the uh, territorial demand on the part of the Kurds as well. He entered the Syria because I think this military operation in Syria against the Kurdish region is very much for domestic consumption because there is going to be an election in 2019. He feels weak. He wants to consolidate himself. And he also wants to use this military operation to justify the, uh, that he needs to renew the state of emergency because country is in a war situation. So in a way, this became a function of his authoritarianism. He wants to use this military operation to consolidate his power and also invest in 2019 election. Turkey will prevail because the Russia, Iran uh, are the two dominant forces in Syria. And they both support Turkish intervention right now. Uh, but Turkey, the, one of the implications, Turkey, the, now the US is working with the Kurds. So there is now more tension between United States and Turkey. Uh, but I, I think Turkey is moving toward Russia and Iran than United States. But the US also doesn't have a policy in the region. The, uh, the US doesn't have ambas uh, ambassador Last six, seven months, there is no American ambassador to Ankara. But Turkey is not the only country. There are over 60 countries without ambassadors. So. I've got a question um, that ties into some of the, the questions we've heard already. Uh, Turkey is very polarized politically. Mm -hmm. Uh, and sometimes that polarization is, is thought of as Islamist versus secular, but I, I think your presentation has complicated that a bit mm -hmm. uh, by teaching us that neo-Ottomanism is not just about an affection for Islam, but is a broader identity construct. Mm -hmm. uh, my question for you is, uh, help me understand why uh, President Erdogan has so much support and how that support uh, has helped to polarize Turkey across identity groups. In other words, which identities has Erdogan tapped into with his brand of neo-Ottomanism uh, that have really resonated with the population? Well, thank you. Um, unfortunately, the Republic um, made a big mistake by identifying Islam as the other or the enemy of its own philosophy of secularism, that uh, oppressed and suppressed Islamic identity is now came back with vengeance, more revengeful. And uh, there is the sense of um, trauma in Anatolia that they were excluded, marginalized by the founding fathers or the secular republic. I think um, with 
as Turkey became more modern, as Turkey became more secular, there was the sense of loss became much more deeper, that we lost something, something is missing. In other words, um, I always sometimes think Turkey as a transvestite identity, that the soul and body do not overlap. Body wants to be European, the spirit is very Eastern. This is what Huntington, Samuel Huntington calls torn identities. The Mexico, Russia, Japan, Turkey. In some cases, the surgical operation succeeded in Japan. They managed to make it a, you know, Western. Whereas in the case of Turkey, the patient ran away from the hospital. The sur so it is incomplete. It, is, it created a major trauma. So um, I think this trauma of being oppressed, being marginalized, or Erdogan says, I am a black Turk. This is Kara Türk. Ben bir Kara Türküm. Uh, Kara Türk means black Turk. Those founding fathers, secular oriented, are called white Turks. Whereas those uh, Muslim or religious or, or oriented conservatives called um, uh, Kara Türk. What worries me is the following from this debate, my own fear, or uh, I will c uh, come back to your question, but uh, the founding fathers, they tried to oppress the memory of the World War I, what Turkey lost, territorially, the grandeur, or ha what happened to the Muslims in the Balkans, in the Caucasus. The, the Kemalist Republic wanted to oppress them. And now that trauma, and the Turks also learned from the Armenians, all the genocide debate. The Armenians want to be victim because there is a Holocaust envy everywhere. Turks want to be victim as well. Now Erdogan, these Kara Turks are digging into this history, what we lost. That scares me, that worries me the most, that this revanchist, or expansionist, revisionist uh, type of identity or policy might prevail. That Erdogan thinks he is a victim. In Anatolia now, there is an, they are writing a new history of Turkey where Turks are victim. And the world needs to recognize. But the victimness is now the fashion, as you know. It is this, uh, the, in France, they pass, even some countries, they try to pass laws to protect the memory laws. You know, it's a big debate in Europe, the memory laws, that you cannot criticize the colonialism, the past. In Russia, you cannot, in Poland, just did a memory law over the Holocaust, as you know. Now, uh, that a number of countries are doing this, and in Turkey now, we are this, uh, you know, it, it's a shocking that this whole Erdogan, black Turk, humiliation, Europe doesn't want us, Europe wants to partition us, now the America wants to divide the country, and our ally, our supporter is Russia and Iran, but we lost most of the wars, we had 12 wars against Russia, we lost all of them, except the last war, because thanks to Lenin, he had the revolution in Moscow, so the Russian army had to withdraw from Anatolia. This is the only war we won. The, uh, it, it was the end of the uh, Brest-Litovsk uh, peace treaty, Ottoman Empire and uh, Russia. So, um, now that, you know, there is a book called uh, The Stranger in Their Own Land, a very popular book now. Uh, the author from our work, the sociologist, tries to, in Louisiana, find out why Louisiana is so bad in environment, health care, but they still vote for Trump. They get the most help from the federal government, yet they are Trump voters. How do you explain this? Uh, situation, uh, I think same way in Turkey too, that the voters, they vote 
for their short-term interests, but they vote against long-term interests, even in short term. That the culture, the identity, this sense of being left out, the sense of being lost, we lost something. I think that is something uh, also there in Turkey as well. And um, the polarization, you are right, Turkey is very polar, but not in terms of secular versus Islamic, because there is no, the secular sector of population, they know what they want. They think for them is the Mecca is Brussels. They think that new Qibla is the European Union. Qibla means the, the orientation you pray. They think that the EU, the Europe, but the Europe doesn't want to give them that opportunity. When you come to the Islamic sector of the population, there is no agreement at all. What is major conflict and tension. So we thought that we will solve the problem through norm, Islamic normativity, but what we found out now, there is, uh, there is no way to have any kind of consensus on the basis of Islam. Please join me in thanking Professor Yavuz. Well, thank you.